Hello, Bethany. Welcome to Tuesday. Well, we're going to go back a few weeks. We're in the midst of the season of Pentecost, or the season of ordinary time, as some call it. We're going to go back to Holy Week. John 19.38 After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of fear of the leaders of the Jews, asked Pilate to, take, to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying where they lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, wrappings but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and saw, and they believed the body had been stolen. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she bent over, she looked into the tomb. I'm going to stop there. I know it's an unusual place to stop, but I think in our culture we um, don't like to stop there. We don't like to stop in the tears. But think about this story. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea basically undercover take the body of Jesus and show respect to their teacher and bury it in sadness. They're doers. They're doing what they can do to respect and honor their friend. Then there's Mary. She's going to the tomb to pay respect, to prepare the body. To We don't know what. It says different things in different books of scripture, what she's doing. Some in this, in John, she's alone. In the other books, she's with other women. In the other books, they have spices. In this account, Nicodemus and Joseph Arimathea took care of the spices. But she comes to the tomb, and the worst things of all, the, the body has been stolen. So she tells Peter... And we believe John, the author of this gospel. And they run and they find that, yes, the tomb is empty. Jesus' body is not there. They don't understand about the resurrection yet. So they leave. And Mary sits outside the tomb, weeping. Peter and John leave and return to the upper room and you think about what what that had to have been like to not only have your friend, your teacher, your Lord die, but then to 
believe that the body had been stolen, had been desecrated. I want to stop there because I want to stop in the morning. We all too often leave morning. Sometimes we just don't want to deal with it. We, we hide it. Matter of fact, if we hide it, we say that strength. Oh, he was so strong. But I like what um, Julius Caesar supposedly had said that uh, when one of his friends died in the battlefield, another general, uh, uh, when one of his friends died in the battlefield, Julius Caesar was weeping. And another general told Caesar, don't weep, that's a sign of weakness. And Caesar said, no, not weeping is a true sign of weakness. God gave us tear ducts. God gave us the ability, the cleansing, the crying helps. So I don't think it's really strong to not cry. But people grieve in different ways. And grief doesn't, doesn't always happen at once. It's a process, you know, five, seven steps, whatever whatever people say, but it's a process and you might think you're through it and then all of a sudden you have a smell or you see something that reminds you of that person or you hear something that reminds you of that person and it all comes flooding right back again. As if it was the day the person died. Recently my father passed away, died. And we had his funeral. I had the honor of preparing most of the arrangements and had the honor of dealing with the thank you cards and the insurance and all of that. And I find myself in a way having already mourned him because a year and a half ago he got sick and was never really the same and it's almost like my father hadn't been here for a year and a half and then about just about every day I get a call from my mom wondering where dad is because of her memory loss she forgets that he had died and so I relive get to relive telling her that over again I'm telling all this because mourning is a process. Grief is a process. You think you're over it, but then it comes back, and that's okay. Sometimes you cry, which is great. Sometimes you don't, which is fine. Sometimes you might get a little angry. Sometimes you might get a little angry at God. As long as you don't hurt yourself or others, that's okay. Grief is a difficult thing. And we can grieve a lot more than just death. We can grieve in the midst of life. Growing up after I was 10, I moved every two years and I found myself hardly saying goodbye to people because I didn't want to deal with the grief again. And it was really hard to make friends because I knew eventually I would lose them again because I'd be moving away. And then when I became a pastor, it became very hard to say goodbye to people when I would go from one community to the next. We grieve that. Even when things happen that are good, like buying a new house, we grieve leaving the old residence. We grieve losing our abilities as we age. We grieve as our children leave the house and start their own lives. Although it's a wonderful, good thing, I still grieve not having my children with me. I also find joy in not having them with me all the time. 
But we have to be honest with ourselves about our grief. And we have to allow ourselves to grieve the losses in our lives. Like I grieve not being able to be in worship with everyone. A letter will be coming out with some changes where we're going to start doing a driving service. And, but still I grieve not seeing all of you, not talking to all of you. I grieve having funerals and not having the community able to be around. There's a lot that we can grieve. But see, grief isn't the end of it. As she wept, Mary bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Our brokenness, our hurt, even our death is not the last word. Doesn't have the final saying. We have that promise that in Christ we have life even in the midst of death. Will you pray with me? Dear God, be with us in our grief. Be with us in our joy. Help us to know that in all of our losses, you will bring life. You will bring hope. In our pain, you will bring healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tomorrow's story day solves. See you tomorrow.